Hi, I want to talk about living in the now. This is a statement I thought about a lot in my life, living in the now. And um, my comments on it remind me of a series of videos I just watched recently by a guy, Michael Bennett. I'll put a link to the first one in which he talks about how non-dualism is bad. I think that the personalities that advocate things like live in the now or, or what is popularly called non-dualism um, they overlap with my more, uh, I don't know, traditional uh, philosophical perspective. So, for example, I mean, when people say they're non-dualists, you know, I think of Cartesian dualism, you know. You know, like the dualism between metaphysics and physics, you know. That there's these two worlds that somehow interrelate, but one of them doesn't count as an interrelator, as a physical, you know. And, and I, I'm a non-dualist. But as he points out in the videos, he's talking about people that use this in a particular way, you know, because there's a lot of non-dualists that advocate for metaphysics. It's like they think there's two worlds, but let's pretend it's a metaphysical one instead. We're all metaphysical. That's their solution to, to the problems of dualism is, is we're all metaphysical really has to be some sort of integration, right? Everything you know, you know, it's the dream world and the waking world are both the real world. They're part of the real world. It doesn't make, if, if your real wa regular waking life is just a waking dream, it doesn't mean it's very much like a sleeping dream. It's, they're still just as distinct as ever before. All the information is the same. So those are interesting videos. Now, in living in the moment, it's the same kind of thing. There's a very deep materialist truth to all you have is the moment. All you have of the past is memories in the moment that you're having now. All you have of the future is potential memories and potential things. You even, there's the parts of the past that you are not recollecting right now, might even be hard to recollect maybe even a suppressed memory, let's say, if we're moving in into the thought experiment level. That knowledge of that past is only in the future through your potential to remember it. <coughs> Nobody's doing dishes. That's the, that's the cat's version of doing dishes, which is to play with its food dish, subtly implying maybe it should have food in it. You got fed this morning. And... Um, so there's truth. We, we live in a, in a moment, you know, and it's all right now. But the, the major mistake, the huge error this leads to to people, and especially uh, people that are going for a new age, metaphysic y, uh, wakey life kind of feel for everything, is the idea of what a moment must be, that it's a point in time. You know, this is, leads to things like there isn't real change. Why? Because it's all actually a moment where there is no change. There is no moment where there's no change. It's just like calculus. The moments are intervals. There's a little bit of change in a moment. Now, how big is a moment? Is it, I wondered when I was a kid, is there an idea of a moment? And it's interesting. In physics, you've got the Planck scale. There's a discrete limit on the shortest amount of time in which something can you know, happen in the universe. That's like an abstract concept of a moment. But as humans, we're dealing with moments that are at the uh, corporal level, you know, like reaction times, you know. So, you know, moments are on the quarter of a second, tenth of a second scale, you know. Um, there's always an interval of information. There's always an interval of memory. It's never a specific instant of nothingness. It's always separated. So I came to the idea that, you know what, you can zoom your sense of a moment in or out. I mean, when you're doing something, you know, when you're playing a sport, you might have jacked your moments down to a rapid series of small moments. But you can also sit back and scale back and just be thinking about your future. And, and I have decided that that's the human mind expanding its sense of moment. So I think the sense of moment for a human mind 
can be adjusted from a very tiny reaction time, tenth of a second, you know, maybe hundredth of a second resolution area, all the way up to the amount of information you can contemplate when you're taking a big picture view. And in that sense, I live in the moment. Uh, it simply means that I always live in a period of time that includes whatever this current period of time is. Right? My moment always has me in it, living and acting. Uh, there's no moment for me uh, after I'm dead, before I'm born. All the moments I know about things like that happen to me while I'm a living. Somebody tells me something happened before I born, was, was born or makes a prediction about something that's going to happen later. And I believe our, our mental facility naturally looks at things this way. The, the scalability of the moment and the, the now, what counts as now, is now, you know, I'm sitting here at the table and doing this this afternoon, at this minute, or is now the world economy is collapsing, you know, that's, that's a moment that's years long. And it depends on, you know, what scale of, of consciousness I've zoned into at the moment, whether I narrow it down to the instant, which I should do if somebody's attacking me, or whether I expand it out to the decades, which I should do if I'm planning my future. I guess there's probably a, a lot of concepts that get some play in sort of new agey um, Western interpretations of, of Eastern thought, um, and but I have much more materialistic definitions for what those things mean. Uh, living in the moment, non-dualism. To me, it comes down to the fact that there's a materialist explanation, and this materialist explanation is not the physical side of the old dualism. It's both. And that dream side of the old dualism is now cognitive science and neurology. Right? So we're not ignoring that part, the, the new materialism by its definition incorporates and describes both of those things. And it's beautiful. There's well, the universe is energy and all the kinds of beautiful things that people wanted because of the way they sounded in these sort of spiritual spheres. They're sort of true, but they just don't roll the dice up where you can ask God for a new Corvette and get one, or you can fly if you think hard enough, because it is what it is. It's still, the world is still the world, so it still gets called mundane, because that still means the world. But all the poetry of how, well, stuff must interact in this beautiful way, yeah, it doesn't mean you get to fly just because you think I'm going to fly, but it does mean that the universe has a, a, a pattern a life, a body, a content um, that is you know, beautiful, stunning. You, know, you can call it timeless. You can use all kinds of phrases in a poetic mode. And yet, what I like about it is you can also drop out of poetic mode and use very direct, shareable, experientialist means to discuss it. And I don't like these scientific oddities and beauties uh, to be used as a reason to not think to, to not think things exist, to not interact, to argue against interaction, to say things are timeless when obviously everything's in motion. And I really don't like if you use a cone like an idea of a, a changeless thing that's changing. You know, it's something you can believe. Those are supposed to help you suspend your belief. You can't assert them like they're true. They're meant to be said because they cease the part of the thought that would otherwise spin around doing something else. So it, it strikes me as sort of a gross popularization of some of this stuff. And, and still, it's a group of people that want to talk about the beauty of the universe, and yet there's still a between the line insult to the universe that it's not good enough the way it is made out of energy and all interacting somehow we have to be able to turn into energy and fly places or something for it to be good enough for them. And life is good enough without that kind of fairy tale, uh, in my opinion. 
and I'm perfectly happy. I wouldn't like the idea of sorry man was not meant to fly, but I'm perfectly happy with the idea that if man wants to fly, he makes a machine, he gets in and flies. You know, uh, I'm okay with that man's body can't just fly because we can use our brain to build a plane and fly anyway. You know, man was not built to go to the moon, but we can do it anyway. I'm fine with that. To me, that's more beautiful than if the space program had been a bunch of monks meditating on a teleportation uh, meditation to teleport to the moon. That I'm, I'm much happier that we had to grapple in the mud of the reality to build something out of steel and, you know, gasoline or hydrogen or whatever, fuel, to get to the moon with strength as opposed to a universe where there's some slippery back door to everywhere. Um, that's not appeal to me. Anyway, cheers.